Hello, I'm Sarah Schechner, the David P. Wheatland Curator of the Collection of Historical Scientific Instruments, and I'm going to talk about the Grand Orrery. The first time I remember seeing the Orrery was as an undergraduate at Radcliffe when it, I went to Houghton Library and saw it there. It used to sit at the base of the stairs. It was down by the bathroom, so if you went it was kind of an isolation, splendid isolation down there. So if you were lucky enough to choose to go to the bathroom, you got to see it. <laughs> to care for this object, it's quite fragile. Often people say, can we crank it up? And as much as we like to do that, it's, we don't want to risk that um, because things could get out of alignment and we'd lose it. The other thing is it requires great care in moving it. We have art handlers and a, a horologist working with us whenever we do have to move it from place to place. And yet we want to feature it as the central piece of our new exhibition. And we want to have the visitor be in an intimate relationship with it, so we plan to have it right as people come in the door, um, not on a pedestal, but down to earth with them where they can come up and approach it from all sides and experience it um, as it was meant to be seen. I'm Simon Schaffer. I'm Professor of History of Science at the University of Cambridge in Britain, and I'm going to talk about God's little machines. I think one starts here by admiring clockwork and then sees through the glass skirt and the gilt brass heroes of the sciences as a structure built up around the heroism of the artisan. A very good way of thinking about orreries is that they are for performances. I mean, we tend now only to see them static, but we need to imagine the extraordinary drama, the histrionics, not just of machinery, but also of lights. This is a world of light and shadow, the room darkened. And in some orreries, not I think this one, but in some orreries, the sun removed, and in its place, a lamp. A newfangled Argand lamp, as it might have been, made by Matthew Bolton of Birmingham and imported here to the American colonies in relatively large numbers. And the drama here, which is very much a drama of light and darkness, is nevertheless supposed to depend on a revelation of in the end, artisanal ingenuity. The praise of Pope at the time and the description of the orrery that Pope gives is clearly about an extraordinarily complex entanglement between artisanal skill and divine design. God is a Boston clockmaker of the most supreme skill. The solar system is the ultimate clock. These metaphors are constantly insisted on, and the performance wanted to show that. My name is Lorraine Daston. I'm a historian of early modern and enlightenment science at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. Isaac Newton had a fantasy, which is that if you took all the matter in the universe and somehow got rid of the empty space in the interstices, you could compact it all into a nutshell. And when one looks at a scientific model like this one, even though it's very large by the standards of an ordinary piece of furniture, it's um, almost incomprehensibly tiny by the scale of the actual solar system. And what it does is to make the solar system available visually at a glance. One might think of this as the dollhouse solar system. It's akin to other scientific ways of making the huge or the complex or the varied visual, like the Wunderkammer or Cabinet of Curiosities, in which the collector would have tried to encompass the whole blooming, buzzing diversity of the universe um, in the form of one room 
in which from floor to ceiling, every square inch was filled with some entity, um, some entities quite fantastic or bizarre. But once again, the aim is to make an enormously difficult um, to grasp phenomenon visible. I'm Owen Gingrich, Research Professor of Astronomy and History of Science at Harvard, and I'm going to talk about the mechanical universe illustrated. This is a wonderful device that involves both time and space. It has incredible gearing down underneath. Uh, and the sad part is it never really worked. The gearing was just way too complicated for what it was trying to do. So in principle, it could show all of these motions. In practice, I suspect it rather rarely did. But nevertheless, it must have been a tremendous teaching device to show what the Copernican system in all its glory looked like. Students would have been clustered around this to have a look. It, they would not have been sitting back in the classroom because I don't think you could see it that well from back there. But gathered around, as the professor was explaining, let us say, why the rings of Saturn would disappear, it would be a wonderful three-dimensional experience that could hardly be obtained just from diagrams in the books. But in terms of a demonstration that could sit in a box in a classroom, uh, this is it. It hasn't been dusted recently. Oh, Owen. <laughs>